Good morning, and welcome to Central Presbyterian Church on this Sunday, August 23rd, 2020. Uh, I am your lay reader, Zach Cosner. Um, I invite you to download the bulletin for today's service. Uh, it can be found in the link that is in the description below this video on YouTube and on Facebook. Or you can head to our website, www.centralprespb.com, click on the publications link on the top of the webpage, scroll down until you see today's date, and click and download. Um, it is uh, formatted for printing at this point. <clears throat> now that I've invited you to download the bulletin, I invite you to look at the announcements found on the back of this week's bulletin. Again, Dominic Munn has placed a blessings box at the fire department in Grady. If you're interested in donating non-perishable food items or books, please contact Jessica Mund or the church via social media. Uh, our username is Central Prez PB. Archives of our online services are, and our podcast um, can be found on our website at www.centralprezpb.com. Uh, you can also find the archives of our uh, videos on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, we also now have online giving available. Uh, you can click on the Donate Now link at the top of the webpage. Uh, we take uh, debit cards, credit cards, and checks. And you can also set up recurring donations on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. With that being said, uh, let us prepare our minds and hearts to worship God. Thanks be to you, O God, that we have risen this day. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when our enemies attack us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth to the rising of this life itself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor, first using the prayer printed in the bulletin, and then silently. Eternal God, in whom we live and move and have our being, whose face is hidden from us by our sins, and whose mercy we forget in the blindness of our hearts, cleanse us from all our offenses, and deliver us from proud thoughts and vain desires that with reverent and humble hearts we may draw near to you, confessing our faults, confiding in your grace, and finding in you our refuge and strength. Through Jesus Christ, your Son. And now silently. Amen. As people born of the water and the Spirit, we have died to the old life, and a new life has begun. God's grace is poured out upon us day by day. Come to the water and remember your baptism. Be thankful and live as one who has been raised to new life. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. And now let us turn to Reverend Tim Reeves for this week's sermon, Oddballs, Fools, Lunatics, and other crazy folk. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Our first reading this morning begins in the first chapter of the book of Exodus at verse 8 and proceeds through the 10th verse of chapter 2. Let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now a new king arose over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, Look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, where they will increase and in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. 
Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pithom and Ramses, for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites and made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shifra and the other Pua, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, Every boy that is born to the Hebrews you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. Then she opened it, or when she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying and she took pity on him. This must be one of the Hebrew children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child and nurse it for me and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Our second reading comes from the 12th chapter of, the, of Paul's letter to the church in Rome, beginning with verse 1 and proceeding through verse 8. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of yourself more highly than you ought to think, but to think with sober judgment each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and not all the members have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ. And individually we are members one of another. We have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. 
And finally, from the 16th chapter of the Gospel according to Matthew, beginning with the 13th verse and proceeding through verse 20. Again, let us listen for the word of the Lord. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Open now our hearts and minds, O God, by the power and presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as your word is read and proclaimed this day, we may hear with joy what it is you would have us hear, that hearing we might believe, and that believing we might live lives of richer and fuller service, glorifying you here on earth as you are glorified in heaven. Amen. Nearly all the wisdom we possess, that is to say true and sound wisdom, consists of two parts, the knowledge of God and of ourselves. Thus begins the first chapter of John Calvin's two-volume work on Reformed theology entitled Institutes of the Christian Religion. And given this morning's sermon title, Oddballs, Fools, Lunatics, and Other Crazy Folk, it might seem strange to begin with a quote about wisdom. But as the Bible reminds us, there is wisdom, and there is wisdom. Paul put it best in his first letter to the church in Corinth, where he wrote, The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. One of the things that passage reminds me is that there is nothing logical about the way God redeemed and restored a fallen humanity. From a purely logical and rational standpoint, words like mercy and grace and forgiveness don't make a lot of sense. There is no 
logical reason why God did not choose and does not choose today to leave us to flounder in the stagnant pool of our sin. There is no reasonable explanation why this God chose to, became, to become one of us and one with us. Or why the incarnate word of God would endure humiliation and degradation and unimaginable suffering for us. Conventional wisdom says that such actions are absolute folly. God must be an oddball, a fool, a lunatic, or just downright crazy. And before you think that I'm being sacrilegious, remember what Paul said. God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. And so it is that we come to the questions posed by Jesus in Caesarea Philippi. First, he asks his disciples who it is that the people say the Son of Man is. Their answers come in quick progression. John the Baptist, Elijah, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Isn't it interesting that in spite of the authority with which Jesus spoke and acted, many people of his day, far from seeing something new in their midst, seemed incapable of experiencing anything but what Yogi Berra called deja vu all over again. Far from seeing Jesus as the harbinger of good news, many saw him only as old news. Been there, heard that. Then Jesus pushes his disciples, but who do you say that I am? These are, after all, the people who are closest to Jesus the ones who have spent time listening to his teachings and witnessing his miracles and traveling with him wherever he has gone, who do they say that he is? And Peter chimes in with the answer, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He answers correctly, not because he's the best and the brightest, not even because he got lucky and made a good guess, but because that answer was revealed to him by God. And the same holds true for us. When we call Jesus Lord and Savior, the Son of the living God, we do so only because God has revealed that truth to us and planted it in our hearts. We know who our Lord is because our Lord chose to make himself known. We love God because God first loved us. We profess faith in Christ Jesus because God has granted us the gift of faith in the first place. And it is on such faith that our Lord decides to build his church, a church against which the gates of Hades will never prevail. Of course, we are told that Jesus then ordered his disciples not to tell anyone what had just been revealed to them, and with good reason, because at this point, they did not know the rest of the story. They did not yet comprehend that Jesus' role of being the Messiah meant that he must be crucified and raised from the dead. They did not yet understand that he as Messiah would defy all conventional wisdom. But we today are not ordered to keep silent. In fact, we are called and commanded to bear witness to all nations and all peoples. 
we are privileged to be the heralds of good news, to be about the business of sharing God's love and forgiveness with everyone we meet. I find it quite telling that the place where Jesus asked this question of his disciples was Caesarea Philippi. Now this was a predominantly Gentile territory situated along the northernmost border of Israel. And at the time of Jesus, three magnificent temples stood in the region. One was for the Syrian god Baal. One was for the Greek god Pan. And one was erected to honor the Roman Caesar because they considered him a god. It was in that environment, rather than in the safety and security of the Galilean countryside, that Jesus chose to ask his disciples, who do you say that I am? Think about that for a moment. It's one thing to answer that question when it is just us surrounded by other believers. It's quite another thing altogether to answer that question in the real world. It's one thing to call Jesus our Lord on Sundays. It's another thing altogether to say that Jesus is Lord of our homes, of our families, of our jobs and of every other aspect of our being. It's one thing to call Jesus Lord when doing so costs us nothing. It's another thing altogether when doing so results in our being called oddballs or foolish or lunatics or crazy at best. And when our livelihoods and very lives may be endangered at worst. If we say that Jesus is Lord, that he is indeed our Messiah and the Son of the living God, then there are very real implications involved, which is what lies behind our reading from Romans this morning. There Paul tells us, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Or as Chuck Campbell once put it, the mercy of God should make you different, odd, unusual in the world. Sometimes being faithful to God will dictate that we take a bold stand against the powers of death and destruction and hatred and bigotry and violence as illustrated by the extraordinary women in our reading from Exodus, and by those who have taken to the streets to remind us that all lives matter, that black lives matter, no more, but certainly no less than anyone else. Shifra and Pua exhibited great faithfulness in refusing to be part of Pharaoh's death-dealing machine. So did Moses' mother and sister. And so, by the way, did Pharaoh's own daughter, who obviously recognized young Moses as a child of the Hebrews and yet defied Pharaoh's order and did not kill this child, but instead preserved his life. Sometimes being faithful will demand that we attack the powers of sin, 
that we vigorously confront evil and falsehood in our midst, or that in spite of all the forces aligned against us, we continue to hold our ground for what is true and what is right and what is just and echo what Martin Luther said when ordered to recant his stance on reforming the church. He stood before his accusers and said, here I stand. God help me. I can do no other. But most often in our lives, faithfulness will never be anything more than the normal, everyday, quiet pursuit of using the God-given gifts and talents that we have in the service of others to glorify God. We have gifts, Paul reminds us, that differ according to the grace given to us. Prophecy in proportion to faith, ministry in ministering, the teacher in teaching, the exhorter in exhortation, the giver in generosity, the leader in diligence, the compassionate in cheerfulness. Often, being faithful will be expressed in being transformed by God's abundant mercy and generous love rather than in conforming to the self-centeredness and selfishness all around us. Most often in our lives, faithfulness is expressed in acts of humility rather than in acts of bravado. It will appear so often to others that they might look at us and say, how odd. But given who our God is, I ask you this, where else would you rather be than among other oddballs, fools, lunatics, and crazy folk who know and understand that the foolishness of God is wiser than any human wisdom. To God be all the honor, glory, and praise forever. Amen. I would ask now at this time you would please join me and, and uh, confirm what it is we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed that can be found in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us now return to God our thanksgiving through our tithes and offerings, which again this week will be made electronically. Find the Donate Now link on our webpage, www.centralprespb.com, and please make your tithe as soon as you possible. If you'd like to mail a check into the church, our address is 6300 Trinity Drive, Pine Bluff, Arkansas, 71603. It is right and our greatest joy to give you thanks, eternal God, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. But we are most grateful for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, and your abiding and sustaining Holy Spirit. For our Lord reconciled us to you and to one another, opening the door to eternal life. Your Holy Spirit continues to confront us, convict us, correct us, and equip us to enter the world and share the good news of your redeeming grace. 
And so, O oh God, we offer up our time, our talents, our treasures, and indeed our very selves for you to use as you see fit until that most glorious day when at the name of Jesus, every knee in heaven and on earth and under the earth shall bend and every tongue shall confess him, Lord, to your honor and glory. Amen. At this time, let us share our joys and concerns, which we have uh, several. Um, Susie Von Tunglin, we want to uh, continue to hold her in prayer. Uh, she uh, will be scheduled to have surgery this coming Friday. Um, we want to continue to hold Emil and Carol Brown in our prayers. Um, I spoke to Mr. Emil uh, this afternoon, or yesterday afternoon, I should say, um, and um, they were doing okay. Um, Carol has a um, procedure uh, planned to, uh, for the 31st of August, uh, so please continue to keep Emil and Carol in your prayers. Uh, continue to keep Dominic Munn and Adam Vick in your prayers as well as they uh, both deal with uh, medical issues. Uh, we ask that you hold um, Thomas Porter, uh, Kara and Kyle Taylor, and Linda Minyard in, our, uh, in your prayers. Uh, we continue to uh, hold the families of Miss Mary Kentz and the family of Don Neal in our prayers uh, for the, both of those um, uh, families have lost those loved ones recently. Um, I want to take a minute and um, single out that we want to uh, pray for all of the school children, uh, the college kids, who uh, some of them who went back uh, this past week. Um, a lot of the Arkansas school kids are going back on Monday. I know that Pine Bluff and Dollaway uh, got theirs postponed a couple days. <clears throat> but we want to continue to hold all of the school kids and uh, in our prayers for a good year, for a COVID-free year. Um, and if something um, as terrible as a COVID outbreak hits in, in some of our schools, we pray that um, not very many children are affected and, and we keep uh, the uh, teachers and staff, including our Reverend Tim Reeves in Stuttgart, <clears throat> protected and um, and may they make it uh, through the school year with uh, happily and healthily and um, and that they learn a lot. And um, we pray for, uh, I want to mention Langston, uh, who is going to a new school this year. Uh, uh, I want to ask for prayer for her, um, that everything goes really well for her. Um, uh, she's a little skittish about going to a new school. Um, and also, as I mentioned, COVID a moment ago. Uh, we want to continue to uh, keep those who are on the front lines, our first responders and our medical professionals um, in, in prayer. Uh, we want to continue to keep those uh, who have lost loved ones who now count in the, in the U.S. over 170,000. <clears> keep those families in our prayers uh, for, um, for them to know that, that the Lord is with them and uh, that we suffer along side their suffering and that we, um, we, we pray for healing for those families and pray for healing for those who uh, have contract, contracted this horrible disease. Uh, we will also continue to hold um, our servicemen uh, and women around the world in prayer. And we'll also continue to uh, hold our, our nation and world in prayer uh, during these uh, troubled, troubled times. Uh, we also wanna keep the Gulf Coast in prayer uh, for the um, for the possibility of a dual hurricane uh, landfalls in the coming days, um, it doesn't look good for for the coast, and and we want to keep those people in prayer as well. So, uh, let us pray. Holy and gracious Father, we give you thanks that the Lord Jesus Christ is in fact today, in fact the same today as he was yesterday, and will be for all of our tomorrows. We want to hold Emil Brown, Carol Brown, Susie Von Tunglin, Adam Vick, and Dominic Munn in prayer for various medical issues. Uh, we pray that your uh, healing hand is placed upon them, that you give the wisdom and the strength to the doctors to perform the necessary tasks, be it surgery, be it medications, be it counsel to those individuals. Uh, we, we pray for a speedy recovery for all of these issues. Uh, we keep the family of 
Don Neal and Mary Kent's in prayer for we know that those families are hurting right now and but we also understand that they are in a better place with you Lord and let, let give peace and tranquility to those families in this time of loss. Please continue to keep Kara and Kyle Taylor, Thomas Porter, and Linda Minyard in your healing and your and your um, holding. Uh, we pray uh, for them this Sunday morning. <clears throat> we also pray for the school children. We pray for the teachers and the staff to be protected medically this year. We we pray that all of the teachers. Uh, teach successfully, that they don't lose too much hair at the uh, at the side of the incoming children. Uh, we ask that the children be um, patient with the uh, teachers this year who are dealing with so much that is new and different uh, due to this horrible pandemic. We ask for your protection over the school children and the staff and administrators. We also ask for patience for the parents of these students who might be asked to do things that they are unaccustomed to doing, um, such as online classes and, and different procedures that they are not used to uh, uh, during the school year. We ask for prayer for the Gulf Coast and for those who are in the path of these dual hurricanes. Uh, we ask that uh, you provide protection for them, for those people from the storm, for we know you are the calm and the light. Uh, we ask for prayer for those who are affected by this horrible pandemic, uh, for the over 170,000 lives that have been lost. Uh, we pray for their families. We pray for our, our medical people, our first responders and those who are on the front lines, our retail workers, and our uh, those who are in uh, harm's way uh, of this horrible pandemic. <clears throat> we ask that you continue to hold our servicemen and women around the world in your caring. We ask that you hold our entire world in your caring because we know that these are tough times with all of the horrible weather and the pandemic and um, the, the uh, unrest that is, that is happening throughout our country and the rest of the world. Uh, and we, uh, uh, we also pray for um, each other and we pray for this ministry and we pray that we will be able to be together again soon. Give us hope as we strive to be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now go out into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power and the presence of God's Holy Spirit, taking today's message with you. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen.